What I love to do is introduce the right people to the right people, I assemble the smartest people I can think of or reach out to to carry that conversation, and that's exactly what I've done today. Please give my panel a round of applause. Welcome. Okay, what's up, guys? This is Jay Martin, CEO of Cambridge House, and I'm joined right now by Dirk Harbecki, the chairman of Rock Tech Lithium. Dirk, how are you? I'm fine. Thanks a lot, Jay. <laughs> Now, I'm really happy to have you on, and I'm looking forward to diving into this story uh, on behalf of my audience so we can get a better look and a better understanding. I've spent a lot of time, Dirk, this year mainly, and the end of last, covering the renewable energy trade, uh, the various trends that are spinning off of this. And we focus largely on the copper and nickel plates. You know, if you're just beginning to get into the renewable energy trade, that's a good place to start, right? And we've covered that extensively, worked some great companies. And I want to take a bit of a deeper dive now, which is why we're talking to a lithium company. But I caution investors all the time. You have to be really, really particular when you're looking at these critical rare earth metals, lithium, et cetera, to make sure you really understand the technology and the macro trends that are driving it. So just as always, everybody who watches this knows, I start with the people when I look at a story. When we look at Rock Tech, you know, it's amazing who you've got in your shareholder base. Uh, I mean, I'm talking about people like Peter Thiel, the first outside investor of Facebook, you know, co-founder of PayPal, well-known uh, billionaire investor. Um, people like Alan Howard, billionaire hedge fund manager from the UK, and it goes on. And, and then we get into yourself, Derek, you personally control 18% of the shares, which is exactly what we want to see. So. I, I want to step back a little bit and we're going to jump into all this stuff um, and what you're building here. But talk to me first about just the EV trends in Europe that you're seeing right now and what's changed recently that investors should be aware of, Dirk. Well, in, in, in especially in the past 12 months, um, I have to say a lot has changed. Look, um, we are working on, on, on RockTech uh, very heavily since 2016, when uh, Elon Musk um, um, presented the Model 3, and especially when the Chinese said, we want to do everything electric. And at that time, I was, I was uh, traveling to China, and I spent some two, three months uh, in the country to see if the Chinese are really serious, yeah? And they were already at that time. I came then back to Europe, had discussions with CEOs of the German car industry and most of the guys said to me well we are never going to produce electric cars and i said to them how can this be i mean you make most of your profits in china yeah you have so many revenues there yeah? and uh, this was the situation in 2016 and since then a lot has changed you cannot even imagine from out uh, from the view of north america when you are now at the european market every day you see a lot of reports about e-mobility the german car industry especially one of the largest globally has clearly decided to fully go electric. So no one else is discussing about hydrogen or other topics. It is a clear decision to go electric. Every week, there are new models that are being presented to the market. And especially, we also see this now in the sales figures. Like in the last quarter of 2020, we had in Germany, as an example, already more than 20% of the newly sold cars were electrified. So this is now, I mean, I'm, I'm talking about the story for, for, for a few years. And I see now also with, with the people I'm talking to that they're saying, well, eventually um, you are to a certain extent right. We see it now. It's coming and it comes really fast here on the continent. Right. And now, so Europe right now is forecasted, correct me if I'm wrong on this, to be the top electric vehicle market in the world, therefore overtaking China this year. Is that accurate? Um, I, I don't think that it is going to happen this year. Okay. So um, at the moment, Europe is, uh, is, is number two, and, but it is much more difficult uh, to really forecast the Chinese market. It is a little bit less transparent. Sure. On, sure. The, on the European market with all the different countries, you have a full transparency of this. Yeah. So it might happen this year, but I, I'm, I'm pretty sure that uh, in the next years, we will see that, uh, that the European uh, car market will be number one in, uh, for the electrification. Okay. Okay. So let's follow that trend and picking up on a second trend that we've seen emerge this year is called like regional independence. This has been, and we're talking about source country uh, when it comes to these minerals. And a, a class example right now is, you know, the Biden administration just took office. They're pro-nuclear. They're incredibly focused on generating uranium, therefore, from friendly nations like ideally us but if not canada and australia so how does the european electric vehicle market dirk impact uh, the critical rare the critical metals and rare earth medicals metals that are required um and and how does rock tech factor into this 
This, this is one of the most important points for the next few years. And actually, um, when, when you look at what the Chinese have done in the past 10, 15 years, um, China does not have too many resources, but they are, they are securing the raw materials, let's say, from Australia. And then they are doing the refinery um, of these uh, materials in China and selling then the pure cobalt, for example, to the world market. Yeah? Um, Europe was always ignorant um, about these things until recently. Um, a few months ago, I think two, three months ago, um, the European Raw Materials Alliance has been set up. We as RockTech, we are one of the founding members of this, and we are supporting it quite a lot. Um, interestingly, the, the think tank behind, uh, behind this idea on the European Union came from, um, came from Berlin, where, where I also spent quite some time and had lots of, lots of discussions with them. Because Europe has understood now, um, as you were mentioning, the supply chains are getting more and more regional, especially supported also over the past 12 months, where, where everyone is really trying to reduce risks and uh, imagine the car industry so far could really rely on very big suppliers. But the picture is now changing completely. It's a revolution. We have now battery cell production facilities that are growing and being built in, in Germany by huge scale. So the European Union started two years ago to support with special subsidy programs the setup of battery cell firms. But they haven't uh, gone a step further into the raw materials and the refined battery metals. And this is now happening um, in the past uh, three, four months, especially is with a clear idea of copying the model that the Chinese have built, yeah, doing mm. the final refinery steps in Europe because we don't have enough raw materials, and then looking for stable and reliable supply from strong partner countries. Partner countries, for example, like like Canada, yeah, with an excellent mining jurisdiction, yeah, uh, where where environmental standards are extremely high, and where you can really also prove that you do a sustainable mining, because the car industry is looking now all the way back in the supply chain to guarantee the sustainability of its product. Right, right. Okay, and now your lithium resource is in Ontario, right near the Great Lakes. Uh, you're building, I guess, Europe's first plants and converter right now. And this is a trend that you'll probably see continue. Do you think it's the first of many in Europe? What are your thoughts, Dirk? There will be many coming, but it's very clear that uh, that we are well positioned to be the first one. Look, um, the majority of the shareholders of, of Optic Lithium, you, you mentioned a few already, the majority are European-based. Yeah, I would say that around 70% uh, of our shares are in hands of, um, of family offices that I also know very well. So we have a strong interest um, to set something up in Europe. And what is also important, at the moment, most likely, we are discussing the figures about the growth rates in, in Europe. Europe is probably two to three years ahead in the development of electric cars compared to North America. Right. So it was a very logical step for us to say, let us be the first to build this bridge between our property and, and our upcoming mine in Canada. As you said, near the Great Lakes, very centrally located, right? So we want to take the mining feedstock there and do the first um, concentration step in the city of uh, Thunder Bay, just at the Great Lakes, and then uh, ship material, Elysium products to Europe, and then do the refinery into what you call the, the lithium battery metals, in this case, uh, lithium hydroxide, right in Germany, just next to the customers. And we have large possible, um, probably, customers here. Look, um, you, you, you saw that Tesla is building a huge gigafactory, the largest one globally, um, in a small city near Berlin. Yeah, we have, um, we have um, VW together with Northwold building a large battery cell production site in Salzgitter, which is in the center of Germany. And we are currently looking at locations, yeah, and are in the final steps of deciding to be just between all the gro all the big plants in, in, in Germany so that we can supply our lithium refined products straight to those customers. And for the number of, um, of the so-called converters, we are going to build uh, the first one, or at least one of the first ones. I assume that we will see in Europe in the next few years, probably 15, 12 to 15 of these conversion plants, because this is necessary to really feed the lithium demand of the car industry here. What's the, what's the capital cost, Dirk, to build one of these conversion plants? 
it is it is around 400 million euros in in capex yeah and okay. what we are trying to do we have we have uh, very advanced um, uh, negotiations around uh, how to put the financing together right you have a debt component you have an equity component and you also have a component around subsidies as i said mm -hmm. europe, europe is really keen to um, to support but it is also a lot about the people and how we are implementing things it is initially to a certain extent about trust because you want the people who are deciding on subsidies and who are deciding on your debt financing, they look at you, they say these are the people that can get it done. They have a great track record. They are doing the right steps. Yeah? And uh, this is a very important thing where, where I have the feeling that we are so far doing a very good job. Yeah, well, clearly. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Now, you know, before I hit record, we were talking about just lithium supply a little bit. And I touched on, well, one of the reasons I haven't talked about lithium a ton of the channel yet is because it's relatively abundant. And so you just have to be really careful about picking the company you want. Mm -hmm. Someone who's cornered the market, I guess, and really ingratiated themselves with the supply chain like you have. But then you countered and said, no, yeah, sure, it's abundant in general, but most of these deposits aren't economic and will never be. So maybe talk to me a little bit about that. Like what's the general landscape of lithium supply right now, Dirk? Well, this is indeed a very interesting point. Look. Um, I have over my lifetime so far built up a, a few companies. And in, in 2016, when the lithium trend originally started, yeah, it was one of my first key questions. Um, will there be an abundance of lithium in the market? Because theoretically, as you said, there's a lot in the ground. And the second question is always about battery technologies. Can lithium batteries be replaced? Yeah, right. so The answer here was pretty fast, pretty quickly, no. So this, this topic I put aside. Yeah? And then we looked at many projects. And the market landscape at the moment is you have a handful of large um, producers of lithium. So it's a, to a certain extent a, a sort of oligopole. You don't have a futures market um, for, li for lithium prices, right? So most of the contracts are directly made between the producer and then the customer, which is a battery cell producer or the producer of the cathode, um, which is part of, of, of the battery, right? And um, they are trying to upscale, of course, but in our point of view, depending on, on, on this demand that we are seeing in the next years, which will be more than 25% yeah, demand increase per year. This is something that never happened before to any metal. Yeah? And lithium is a highly reactive metal. It is the lightest one and highly reactive. So when you find it in the ground with too much and too many other metals, like for example, in, 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 the, in the brine deposits in these uh, salt lakes in Bolivia, you have a very, relatively high content of magnesium. And it is a big challenge to filter this magnesium out because eventually you need a very pure lithium product. So the most successful producers at the moment are in are the hard rock producers, uh, mostly out of Australia, who are producing around 60% of the global lithium supply is coming from there. And this is like, like the projects that we are also having in Canada. We have hard rock pegmatite projects. You have 1% or even more on, on average on, of lithium in the ground. And this is... Uh, this is something you can handle relatively well and you can produce for relatively uh, low prices. Of course, there are many new ideas, many new projects coming up. Um, but I, I can only repeat, it is a very challenging market. And eventually, you have to become one of the low-cost producers. And therefore, the quality of an asset is very important. Right. Okay. Okay. Thanks for that. Now, so just to recap a lot of what you said, you know, we've we've secured a resource in a jurisdiction that has a government that's historically been reliable and trustworthy, um, great history of supporting mining, you know, current administration, we're not sure, but generally speaking, you know, the trend is in our favor. Uh, <laughs> and then, you know, you're building out the supply chain, right? So the conversion plant, the refinery in Germany, right next to the end user, which is where you want to be. And that's why Rock Tech is strategically positioned. Dirk, what do you have to say to shareholders who will be looking for news in the next six, 12 months, prospective shareholders that are curious and sniffing around the story? What can they look forward to right now? Well, we, we are now at the stage where we are doing the pre-feasibility studies and the basic engineering, yeah, which is already quite complex for, for such a conversion a con converter plant in, in, in Europe. Yeah? At the same time, we have started the pilot plant uh, production 
of uh, lithium hydroxide, which is important because we have initiated, of course, um, conversations with possible off-take partners, so the, um, the buyers of our product, right? And when you have your first samples out of your pilot plant production, you are then using this uh, for these kind of negotiations, yeah? So in, in the next few months, we are scaling up the team with, with very high-class uh, people in Canada as well as in, as in Europe. Um, we produce our first lithium hydroxide and intensify then the discussions with, with possible uh, offtake partners. I assume that we get into agreements in, in, the, course of, um, in the course of this year. Yeah? We are then getting into the um, final planning stages for the engineering work of the converter. And um, eventually, by end of this year or early next year, we are starting to put then the, um, the financing for this uh, first uh, converter uh, together and are most likely starting the um, the construction of this middle of next year. So this is roughly the timeline. So you see, we are we are we are pretty close um, to get to very important steps, which will also cause um, an interesting news flow over the coming months. So yeah, Dirk, I know we touched on this at the beginning. I, I do want to recap your shareholder base a little bit, just because it's remarkably tightly held. And I think you said it, something like 70% is held by professional investors, money managers, yourself, company management, uh, which is exactly what we want to see. Some legendary shareholders like Peter Thiel, Alan Howard. Um, anybody else you want to touch on though, Dirk, that you think our audience should know about? Well, um, in our existing shareholder base, yeah, we have we have further investors who are very very skilled um, uh, out of the biotech industry, for example, out of real estate industries. These are all industries that are interestingly yeah, related uh, to, to to what we are doing. Because when 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 you look at these kind of interest uh, of these kind of, of industries, yeah, the um, the way how you develop projects, yeah, you can learn a lot of this. You can take a lot of experiences, and especially these are also all investors um, who understand the concept concept that you are building something big, but that it still takes um, about two years until you can start to generate any kind of cash flow, right? There yeah. are many shareholders who are, of course, shying away from this to say we want more companies that are already generating a cash flow. I understand this. These kind of companies um, uh, seem to be more secure, but of course, the upside is much smaller. And our shareholders understand um, what we are building. They are very much convinced that we will do this successfully and to see exactly um, what this might then mean to our to our share price in, in the next two years. Yeah, And so far, it was very important for us. When I'm saying shareholder value, it really means shareholder value. We do not like too much dilution, of course, because we, we, we believe in the story and we want to keep our stakes. Eh? Um, nevertheless, I think in the, in the course of this year, we will get uh, one or two um, important strategic partners also on board um, that are giving them also to, to other shareholders um, a strategic and industrial proof of concept. I think I think with investors like 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 Peter, we have very much a financial proof of our concept already. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but there will be then more coming in 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 the course of this year. So um, the shareholder structure will remain and becoming more and more interesting. <laughs> Okay, well, now, now I have to ask because I'm just super curious. What can you share about your strategic industrial partners? Who are you looking for? Are any conversations on the table? Anything you can share about that? Uh, this, um, I, I have to be cautious about these kind of, of, of commentaries. You, you, you know this. But when I'm talking about um, strategic partners, these are then the kind of partners either you are talking about uh, the car industry directly, right? Mm. Or you are talking about... Um, so-called EPC contractors, which are the people that are buying, uh, that are building eventually your plant. And EPC is an engineering, procurement, construction company. These are huge international conglomerates yeah, that have an interest to get into this um, into this new industry eventually of um, of, of lithium converters, right? Um, but you're also talking about companies that might come in from the um, renewable energies perspective. What we haven't mentioned, we have talked a lot about electric uh, vehicles, but keep in mind, our lithium is needed for batteries. And when you look, for example, what Tesla is doing, they are also building large uh, battery storage facilities for national power grids. They are doing this in California. They are doing this in Australia. This means that 
um, power uh, utilities, yeah, um, are companies that are looking now how to how to uh, secure supply and how to get into this kind of business. Yeah, it is a power and renewables business very much, and not only electric vehicles business. So you have a certain um, amount of strategic partners, and we have we have discussions on all these fronts, of course, um, because we 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 see the full picture and we have all these companies also seeing the full picture and the need for lithium supply for them. Yeah, thanks for touching on that, because I think often when we think about the electrification of our world, we, we go right to cars because they're tangible, they're interface, they're consumer goods, we all use them, and it's very easy to understand. Uh, but that's really just scratching the surface, right, of what electrifying right. really means. Okay, look, Derek, it's been great having you on. I'd love to do this again, especially uh, maybe in six months, we've got some more developments to talk about. Thank you for introducing the story to my audience and taking the time. I really appreciate it. Thanks a lot, Jay. It was a pleasure. Nice talking to you.